Hi, hello, welcome to Chasm Words. My name is Sam and I'm so happy to see you here today. I am going to be doing my non-spoiler review of the Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn trilogy by Tad Williams. I'm also going to be posting tomorrow a spoiler-filled discussion of it, so if you've read the books and you want to hear my more in-depth thoughts, or even if you haven't read the books and you're curious about some of the things that I mention here but don't go into a lot of detail, you can definitely check that out. I will say though, this series is definitely worth reading and I don't recommend spoiling yourself because it's fun to get a lot of the reveals. So yes, that's, that's what I'm going to say. I also want to fully apologize for my hair. I, I, I don't know why. It's just decided it's not going to do anything I want it to do today, including lie flat. It is just a mess and I've tried pretty much everything. Putting it up was the least of the evils, so that's what I did and it still kind of looks awful. So I'm very sorry, but uh, it is quarantine, so you know what? I think it's acceptable that my hair looks like this. I got my notes here in my ledger of perceived slights. Um, this is such a cute notebook. It's from The Mincing Mockingbird. And yes, I do have a couple pages of like notes and thoughts. So if you see me looking down, I'm looking at this thing. But what is the Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn trilogy by Tad Williams? Well, first of all, there are very, very big books. These are the reprinted, I think maybe anniversary editions. They were put out right in time for his new trilogy to be beginning its release, which I think started in like 2016, 2017, something like that. I do have the first two books in it. I just haven't started. And book three supposedly is coming out this year. We'll see. And actually, fun fact, when the third book, Green Angel Tower, originally came out in paperback, they had to print it as two different books because it is that huge. I think I've also seen it's like the longest fantasy book ever published, so yeah, it's a big boy. It's a very, well, okay. Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn is a somewhat traditional fantasy series that was published in the early 80s. It's got a young hero, Simon Mooncalf, who is a nobody. He works as a serving boy at the castle kitchen, and he gets entangled in a huge adventure after he helps the prince. <laughs> yeah, and it, you know, he goes on an adventure. He meets a lot of colorful characters. He becomes a hero, very much that farm boy to hero type trope as well as a lot of other really beloved fantasy tropes. I really like the traditional fantasy tropes. I think they're a lot of fun. Sword and sorcery stuff is great. There's these three swords that play a huge role, which is why there's a sword on the cover, and there's sort of a fetch quest plot line going along as well. A lot of mystery. There's some magic. The magic in this world is not super, like, I don't want to say super important, but it's really not like it's an aspect of it and it is important in that way, but it's not like something a lot of people have access to and it's not really a central focus. But yeah, I mean, it's it's really traditional in those ways. However, when these books came out, they actually broke a lot of those molds and they did something interesting with them. The characters here, we have Joshua Lackhand. He is the younger prince of the King Prester John, who at the very beginning of this book dies. And Joshua is the younger brother. He's not interested in ruling. He's not interested in being a king or really a prince. He just kind of wants to do his own thing. But he's forced into a situation he doesn't want to be in. And he's a very different kind of princely character than the ones you would typically see. This took a lot of the molds of Tolkien and just changed them, broke them, made it more interesting, and there are actually a lot of big name contemporary fantasy writers who look to this series and say, this inspired me because I saw what it could do differently, that it could do something really special and really cool with this fantasy genre. And those authors include George R. R. Martin, I think Brandon Sanderson, definitely Patrick Rothfuss, Christopher Paolini, and even outside of those authors, I definitely see the influence on other modern fantasy that I've read, like Sarah J. Mass, Brandon Sanderson, which I mentioned, I definitely see the parallels there. Just, just numbers of, of things that happen in this series I can look at and say, yes, I can see exactly where that correlation was, how it could have inspired the seed of 
growth and change that then inspired all these other wonderful fantasy series that we have today. So this is a non-spoiler review. I'm going to be doing my best not to spoil anything. I, I mean, I'm going to speak as vaguely as I can. That being said, in order to talk at all about these books, I do have to get to about uh, maybe like the one third point of book one because the start of it is so slow and we don't actually get a lot of the plot or characters until we actually reach that point. So if you don't want to be spoiled for anything, definitely look away now. But if you're curious to know my thoughts on the book, please keep watching. I'd love to have you here. First of all, the writing and the mechanics of the book. I myself am a writer, not a published one, but it is something that I spend a lot of time working on and growing my craft and just reading books and not just reading them for fun, but kind of looking at, okay, how does it work? Is it working well? So I feel like I can like somewhat talk about the craft of the books and that's what I'm going to do. My biggest complaint is how slow the beginnings are. Book one suffers the most from this. It is just tedious and very difficult to get through, especially considering the character of Simon, who is our protagonist, is annoying and kind of whiny and just not interested in any of the things that the reader is interested in. Like, he's apprenticed to Dr. Morganis and Morganis is giving him history lessons and he's like literally thinking, oh, I wish I was like doing this other thing. And it's like, oh my God, Simon, but I'm interested. And this goes on, I want to say for like 200 pages. It is incredibly long and incredibly slow. When the action does pick up, it does pick up and it doesn't really stop. There are lulls in the story like I feel like during a lot of the travel scenes there can be moments where I'm just like yes we've traveled for a lot can something big happen there was a point where I think and I'm not going to say which book it was in but there is a point where I was kind of feeling like Simon had been traveling with these characters and with companions for so long but hadn't really struck out on his own yet and I was like okay it's time for Simon to go do something on his own and grow as a character in that way because that's very important for that like farm boy to hero storyline is for the hero to be alone to be isolated and have to like basically survive on his own and find himself in, in that regard and I got that feeling and then he kept traveling with other people and I was like okay but like he's stagnating a little bit the book did, not too long after, it did eventually like give Simon his alone time. But I just felt like it took a longer time than it needed to to get to that point. I also think books two and three also start really slow. Book two more so than book three, but book three definitely doesn't just like explode into action like I wanted it to. It very much lets itself take its time. Book two, I was like so excited to get into because the things that ended book one was like, whoa, this is amazing. And then book two had like a hundred pages of just being like, okay, we're waiting, small plot developments, but you're not moving, you're not doing anything, a little bit of world building, but really we're not doing anything. And it was really frustrating. I was finding it very difficult with every book to just keep getting into it. Once I was into the books, I was super dedicated because these books are really well written, especially the descriptions of places are just beautiful. And there would be like lines that would like pop out at me and I'm like, this is a fantastic line. This is absolutely stunning. Actually, speaking of like the beginning of book one, when Tad Williams is describing the Hayholt, which is the castle, I was just blown away by this description. It was just beautiful and intricate and really, really painted a picture for me. So in that regard, it is it, it was easy enough to read. It wasn't like boring to read if you're looking at like the words themselves. But action wise, it was incredibly slow beginnings for all three of them. Another sort of negative about the writing was the timeline. The ancient history of the world makes sense to me. Like I could follow that because we do kind of get there like humans came later. The first beings who were there were like the Scythi. They came from across the ocean basically. They're like elven type characters. Which side note, I love how like he didn't call them like elves or dwarves or uh, I, I don't know. I guess probably that's the only analogs 
hobbits. Um, like he didn't call them that. He gave them new names. There are Sithi and Kanak um, and Dwaro and Niskis. And I really, really, really liked that. Um, that's more like world building note, but I just, I loved that they weren't traditional like elves or anything. Um, so yes, the, but they, they are like, they're analogous, but they're not, they're not, they're not elves. And in fact, I think like the Sithi are a little more alien to humans than elves are to humans. And again, I really liked that feature, but digress. The like ancient history of the world, I could follow. That made a lot of sense to me and I really liked it. And it was easy to follow that timeline, especially when it was explained to the characters and to the reader. It was the immediate timeline of events that I just, there were so many moments where I was like, wait, how much time has passed? I had gotten like three quarters of the way through book one before I come across a line that's like, oh, two years ago when Prester John died, which that's not a spoiler because that's literally pretty much how the book starts is with Prester John the king dying and his son Elias taking the throne. But the line is like, oh, it's two years since Prester John died. And I was like, hold up, two years? Two years, are you kidding me? It felt like it had been like maybe like six months. But I had to look back and I was like, okay, two years. Eventually I looked at like a timeline online and I was like, wow, it two years. The book did not make that clear to me. And there would be moments like that where I'd be like, wait, how many months have passed? That just threw me off. And this happened throughout the whole trilogy. I had to keep referring to like timelines and worried about getting spoiled. At one point I just gave up and I was like, all right, at the end I will look at a timeline. And I finally did. And I'm finally like, okay, I get it now. But really wish it could have been clearer in the books themselves. Because anytime that would happen, I would be taken out of the story and being like, whoa, what? One of the absolute strengths of this book, and I didn't expect it considering how the book starts, are the characters. I loved the characters. I loved them so much more than I thought I would. And I'm going to go into this a little later in the review because I have a, like a section dedicated to characters. But I loved them. I felt so connected with them. And it doesn't normally take me that much to get connected to characters. But I find that epic fantasy with a really big cast of characters, which this definitely has, it's a lot harder for me to glom onto them and find myself caring deeply about them. I have a, an okay time with Game of Thrones. It's a little easier with Game of Thrones because as big as that cast is, the point of view characters feel very easy to connect with. But like Stormlight Archive, I have an incredibly hard time like choosing a character and connecting with them. Maybe like one, like I really like Shallon. I've only read the first two Stormlight Archives. This might change if I read more, but like, I just have a hard time connecting with them. This book series, I I adored them all. I thought they were really great. They're all really well written. They're all very distinct, not just in the way he writes them. Like some characters sound like they have an accent. Characters from different parts of the world, and it is a really large world, feel distinct. There are different customs and cultures and religions and all these things that color the characters. And even within those cultures, you'll have like groups of characters who maybe they share a lot of these same traits, they still feel unique to one another. And I loved that. I thought it was so well done. And I had the easiest time connecting with just about everybody. I say I didn't expect this to happen because at the beginning of the book, the only character we really have is Simon and he is so hard to connect with at the beginning. To be fair, he's only like 14 and he's kind of whiny and seriously immature, but he's very difficult to connect with. And I didn't actually find myself connecting with Simon until closer toward the end of book one, when I really started to care about him. All the other characters though, it did not take me one, cause we don't get a lot of different point of views until about like halfway through book one. And then the world starts widening. And books two and three really just like share so much of the world and so much of the characters. And they do it so wonderfully. But like book one, it just took a while to like get to those. But once you start getting to them, it's very easy to find yourself just drawn to and connecting with them. Again, though, we're going to talk about characters more in a little bit. I just want to mention that the characters are seriously a strong point in the book, especially writing wise. He just writes them so well. That being said, my biggest issue with the books also has to do with the characters and the writing of the characters, because there are a handful of characters whose arcs feel I hate to say wasted, but in a lot of ways, they feel wasted. It feels like they are a 
ball rolling down the hill, gaining momentum. And then rather than like continuing to roll when they hit the bottom of the hill, they just stop. And it was so obnoxious, <laughs> especially because it's some characters that I really cared about. And I was like, I understand that this event that happens had to happen. Like this had to, this, their, the thing they did affected another thing and that needed to happen. And that I'm fine with to a degree. It's just the way it happened, like in their character arcs that I was just like, I feel like you've thrown these characters out for the sake of the plot or for another character. And it was so frustrating to get to the end of this series and to be like, wait, that's it for X, Y, and Z. That's it. After all this build up, that's it. I know we get more books, you know, there's the new trilogy, but that being said, the series does and should stand on its own. And it was incredibly disappointing to watch these characters get just wasted like this. It, it made me really frustrated. I'm going to talk about specifics a lot more in my spoiler discussion. So if you're curious about who specifically I'm talking about and why it bothered me so much, tune in for that. But just know I was so frustrated and disappointed by the choices made regarding these characters. Okay, the world building of these books is amazing. I mean, I don't want to say too much because I feel like it's so much fun to explore the world and get to know it with the characters. Because Simon, as I said, is from the castle. He's never really left. And then when he leaves on his adventure, he's learning all these things and exploring them just like we are. And he is an inquisitive character, so he's asking a lot of questions. Now, we don't just see the world through Simon's point of view. We do get a lot of other point of view characters, especially as the series grows. And there's a lot of really, really wonderful showing, not telling moments where again the world is just so expansive and every region of it is so very different. It a hundred percent feels like a world I would want to explore myself, walk around in, get to know, and it feels so very real. It feels a step away from our own. One of my favorite aspects of this was the religion. At first it was kind of off-putting. It's a the main religion of the world of Austin Ard is very Christian inspired. There's like a one God, there's even like a Jesus figure. And I was like, this is like weird for me to read a fantasy like this. Cause I feel like there's not a lot that is just such direct parallels. And I was really unsure how I was going to feel about this, about this aspect of the religion of the religion of the world. As I read, Tad Williams does such a good job not just showing people who are dedicated to that faith system, but also people who question it and people who believe in different things. He gives it a lot of nuance. He gives it a lot of power without making it overwhelming to the story. Because this isn't really a story about religion. It's just another aspect of the world building. And I really liked that. I honestly feel like I could do a whole video just talking about Tad Williams' approach to religion in this series. And I might someday. I think that would be a really cool video to do. But that's not today. <laughs> there are other religions in the book and they're treated with just as much respect and um, they're given as much, I don't want to say prominence, but they're treated as much as like, oh, this could be real as like this other religion. Like all religions are treated with the same amount of respect and authenticity to them. And I really appreciated that because I don't think that's something that we necessarily see in our real world. I think there are a lot of people, especially if you're like looking at, I don't know, like I feel like contemporary stories that ever touch on like religion, it's, it's very much like, oh, one of them is the real religion. And the others are just like, oh, these are fake, you know, or these are, are pagan, or these are ridiculous. Like, I feel like even other fantasies have done this. And it's really frustrating. But this one, even if there are characters who might be like, oh, you, you pagan here in a theory, like, then the book itself is completely objective. And it's like, oh, well, one religion is as much real as another or as much made up as another, you know, considering how you're gonna look at it. And I really, really appreciate it. I thought it was done 
with such a deft, clever hand. And yes, I just, I have to point that out because it is phenomenally done. Characters! There are so many characters and I could definitely go and talk about every single one with a lot of depth and just sing their praises because I think everyone is really wonderful. I think a lot of the characters go through just great growths. Like I said, I did have some disappointments with character arcs. Again, check out the spoiler review for that. But I did make a little list of the characters I most wanted to talk about. So we're going to do those characters. I didn't write Joshua down because he's another kind of character I feel like I could spend a whole video talking about. I will say I loved his character. I cared deeply about him. I thought he was a great, great character who really broke the mold of like prince type characters. He actually in some ways reminded me a lot of Verity from Robin Hobb's Farseer trilogy. But he was also very much his own character. And I, I do just want to point out that I really did like Joshua and I wasn't sure how I'd feel about him because he's very emo at the beginning of book one. But yes, really like Joshua. Just want to point that out. I mean, I really loved everyone, really. But um, Joshua was just a lot of fun. I also, I, I should have probably mentioned this in the writing aspect, but the point of view characters that we get are not always like good guys. Sometimes we get point of views from characters who are, you know, villains. We get some Guthwolf chapters. We get some Fangbold chapters. We get some Phyrates chapters, like we get villains. And I really liked that because it's making the story more nuanced. It's not necessarily humanizing the characters we're seeing. In some cases it does and in some cases it doesn't. But it's giving the reader a larger picture of the story and I really, really enjoyed that. But the characters that I want to talk about. First of all, Simon. Simon is our protagonist. He's the farm boy to hero trope. He is so whiny and annoying and boring at the beginning of this series that I honestly did not believe I would ever enjoy reading about him. I was like, ugh, Simon. He definitely grows on me. There's a point when the book kind of, when events start happening in the book and he's basically lost a little bit on his own and just kind of wandering around and stumbling. And that was the point where I started to actually have any sympathy for him. I think that's also the point where Simon becomes more human of a character because he's more present. Up until this point, he's very much just not interested in the events that are happening around him. At this, And then when this happens, he is suddenly involved in the events. And that's when he becomes more sympathetic. That's when he becomes more interesting. The story as a whole, we definitely see Simon grow. He grows not only in age and like stature, like the book actually does talk a lot about how he's starting to like physically look more like a man, like he grows a beard and stuff. And I did like that. I liked those touches. It wasn't overwhelming. It was nice to have that physical parallel to what's happening, happening mentally, because as these physical changes are happening mentally, he's also becoming a lot more curious about things that adults are curious about. He questions the religion for a little bit. He questions, you know, his role in things. He's trying to figure out who he is. That being said, there is still a lot of whining on his part. There are so many moments where he goes, oh, why me? Why does this have to be me? And I'm just like, Simon, get over it. Yes, it sucks the situation you're in, but you're in the situation and you have to deal with it now, regardless of if you want to or not. That doesn't change too much. His character very much culminates in a way that's very expected. Yeah, I, I, there weren't a lot of surprises for me. I was just like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. There were a lot of characters who did have surprises in their storyline, but Simon is definitely not one of them. I saw it coming a mile off. Even so, I thought it was still, you know, definitely an interesting and great story. I liked following him. For protagonist, he's not my favorite character. He's not even necessarily the most interesting character. There are moments, especially the end of book two and yeah, the end of book three, where he becomes the most interesting character. But he's not often the one I'm like, oh, I'm dying to know what happens to Simon right now. Something Tad Williams does. And this is part of his like breaking the mold of fantasy is he gives characters who wouldn't typically have a voice or a point of view and he makes them central characters. And the two that I specifically want to talk about are Benevik and Timic. Timic gets point of views. He does almost nothing until like book three. I'll be honest. He has such, ugh, 
point of views in book one I think like maybe two and you're just like okay I guess like you're kind of interesting but we know nothing about you we're just kind of seeing your culture your daily life it's like a very slice of life for Tiamak he finally starts getting involved in events in book two but book three is really where he shines and where I could look at his character and say this was so wonderfully done he is a swamp dwelling type character type character he I don't know what that means he lives in a swamp his people are often considered very backwoods very dirty weird and he is a learned character within his his world the ran the other ranamen are like oh he went to school how weird so he's an outsider in both his culture his village and the outside world and he just he is such a great point of view character to have. He not only brings this really wonderful texture to the story because we get to see things through his point of view, but he brings a really important elements to the story and gets to be a hero in his own right. He is the sort of character that I almost never see get to be the hero in fantasy books. And I was just so happy to see it. I thought it was just lovely to see a character like this. Binnebeck is in some ways the sidekick character. He's a Kanek or a troll and he is somewhat the sidekick character, somewhat the mentor character to Simon. And he was so just, he had so many layers and depths to him. Anytime he was on the page, I was like, yes, Binnebeck, you are so cool. Tell me more. I don't think he could hold his own story, but I would enjoy reading it anyways. <laughs> he is just, he feels like he could have been the main character if this was a different type of story. But at the same time, he's very much the character who I feel like never gets that much of a prominence in a book like this. Partly because he's not human and partly because he does have that sort of sidekick standing and mentor standing. Like he, he straddles this very thin line. Him and Simon are definitely like best friends. But there's also a little distance there because like it's very clear Simon is the hero and Binnebeck is a guide and helper. Yeah, it's weird that he like straddles that line. It works really well. It mixes really well. But he's not a character who I feel would typically get as much screen time as he does. But he's great. Benevik's great. I, but he, when he enters the story in book one, which is about a third of the way through, that's when, like, the, the events had started happening. But that is when the book just lights up and when it becomes so much more of a pleasure to read. He just, his presence changes the book so intrinsically. It just, it would not be as good of a series without him in it. So kudos to you, Benedict. You should be the real hero. Female characters. When I read Wheel of Time, no, when I read the Shannara books by Terry Brooks, I read the first one and I couldn't even finish it because there are like no female characters. It was such a glaring hole in the story and it just bothered me so much. And it bothered me unconsciously for a long time until I realized that was my problem with the book. And I've definitely run into that with other fantasy books where there are fewer female characters or a lack of dynamic female characters or every female character feels the same or there's like just one female character and not to like point fingers at Brandon Sanderson because I think he can write really good female characters and he does but like if you look at the original Mistborn trilogy or at least the first Mistborn book the really only prominent female character unless I'm misremembering is Vin and as much as I love Vin and the other characters in that book it's so notable that she's like the special female character and there aren't a lot of other women. I was so worried Memory Sorrow and Thorn was going to follow a similar trajectory because it takes so long before we actually see another female character or another before we see a female character with agency enter the story. It takes so long. <laughs> I don't want to say too long because there isn't that much space for more characters past Simon at the very beginning but they I, I don't know it was a little annoying that I was like okay there are women in this book right I asked my friend who I was buddy reading it with I was like are there female characters she was like yes so it does take a little bit to introduce them 
but there actually are a lot. There, is it a spoiler to share? I don't think so. Hmm. It might be. I'm not going to. There are a lot though. They're all very different. They are distinct. They all have agency. They all have very different goals. They have differing levels of like how much you like them, how good of a person they are, what decisions they make are. They're very distinct. Just as all the male characters are. They're very distinct and I loved that. Uh, the main female protagonist I don't know how to put it into words without spoiling, spoil, yeah, spoil, spoiling, spoiling, without spoiling it. But she just was written so well that her storyline and her decisions and her plot, I had to just like stop a couple times because I was like, this is real and this hurts because this feels not necessarily personal to me, but personal to the female experience. And Yes, I just, it took a little bit to introduce the women, but when they're there, they're great. They really are great. This doesn't suffer from the male fantasy, heavy male gaze. It doesn't. It, it really doesn't. So <laughs> that alone earns the book like a, a star, if I'm being honest, a whole star. And finally, and this is just because he's my favorite, is Grimner. He is my favorite character. Anytime he was on page, he was hilarious, he was iconic, he could do no wrong in my eyes, and I just, I love him so much. Really, he's not that special of a character. I don't know if I would have appreciated him this much if he wasn't that funny, but oh, I just loved his Grimner so much. He was just perfect. Perfection. The plot. So I mentioned that it's a very traditional kind of quest plot, and it is the writing, the story itself, the characters, they really make it easy and enjoyable to read. So even though there is a lot of traveling, even though there is a fetch quest, even though it does rely on some tropes like hero, like farm boy to hero, again, super easy to enjoy while reading. I think looking back at it, um, now that they have a little distance, I can say, yeah, there were moments that felt like they could have been a little shorter. But yeah, while I'm reading the book, I honestly didn't notice I was enjoying it quite a bit. So plot, yeah, I enjoyed those aspects. As for the big bad, it is very much like this is an ancient evil and that was fine. He was properly scary without being, I don't know, too solid. He wasn't a very human character or a character I could be like, wow, you're directly scary as a person, more just everything you're doing is terrifying and you're awful. He's very vaguely written too and I think that was on purpose. We really aren't meant to know too much about the big bad because the characters don't know that much about the big bad. You know, they know the very vague strokes. They know they need to stop him and why, but they don't, you know, you don't really get to see him as a person. You just see him as like, oh, he's the villain. He's, he's Sauron. So, you know, that was fine. I, it's not my favorite type of villain in a story, but for the story it worked well. So, you know, the stakes in this book pitch perfect. Maybe it's because I'm reading a book right now that feels like there are no stakes at all, but the stakes in Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn, they keep you on the edge of your seat. You are definitely worried for the characters, all of them. You're worried they could die and they feel like they could. They're put in peril all the time. You're worried they could have a fate worse than death and some characters do and a lot of characters die. There is a pretty decent body count, especially in book three, and you get a lot of named characters. You even get some point of view characters who are just, eh, they're gone. And it's very sad. And they, you know, they left holes in the story. They felt like they could have kept living. They didn't necessarily feel like they, like, you know how like George R. R. Martin, he's able, it, spoilers for Game of Thrones, but I feel like it's not much of a spoiler these days. But when Ned Stark dies at the end of book one, you feel like he could have kept living and he would have had plot. And that's how these characters feel. They feel like had they kept living, they would have had plot. And it is so sad to say goodbye to all of them. It was so hard to just weather those losses. And because of that, anytime any character was put in peril and I was worried about them, I actually thought they might die, that they might suffer real consequences. And it affected me. It made the book come alive because I seriously could have seen anyone dying. So yes, the stakes in this book, 
great for a fantasy great actually it kills the dollar kills the darling tad williams actually killed his darlings that's what i'm trying to say and on a smaller note like the plot has some horror elements there are scenes that are so genuinely creepy and scary and i'm not a big horror fan but they worked so well in the series they just were just like cherries on top of an already great story there are so many great horror moments that are just like imprinted on my mind. Ugh, wonderful, wonderful. Do I recommend it? Yes, I think that should be clear. I loved it. This series as a whole gets four and a half stars. Book one is probably closer to 3.54 stars, book two, 4.5 stars, and book three, five stars. But yes, the series as a whole, four and a half stars. I thought it was really fantastic for all the reasons I've just shared with you. I definitely recommend it if you're a fantasy fan. I think it's a fantasy that someone who doesn't read a lot of the genre could step into comfortably. However, I do think it's not a great gateway fantasy. I don't know if it would actually inspire you to start reading more fantasy so much as if you were getting into fantasy, it would be a good like second or third series to maybe pick up. I also recommend it because it is clearly a liberal leaning series. There is a character who at one point literally thinks to herself, wow, I have privilege and acknowledges this. And I'm like, oh, hey, this was written in the 80s. <laughs> like, whoa, this is great. It's It feels ahead of its time for fantasy. It definitely deals with uh, colonialism a little bit. Obviously it's like a white man talking about colonialism. So it's not necessarily the perspective you want if that's what you're reading fantasy for but it does tackle it it does deal with it it deals with slavery a little bit slavery is not really a thing in the world I think there are like passing mentions to other countries that might have it but it's not really a thing in Austin art it's more of like an a part of like the ancient history of the world going into it more than that I feel like would be spoiler territory so it won't but it does it tackles all these things and is like these are all really bad and it does especially the colonialism aspect it does try and to some degree deal with the effects of a world that has experienced that and it tries to and I think it does like a, a passable job of having a conversation about who belongs on a land especially when so many generations have passed since the people who came and, and took it over from the people who originally had it. And it talks about displacement and it talks about just the rights to living and who bears the burden and what that burden looks like. Again, it's a white guy talking about all this. So it's not, it's not centered and it's not, uh, by centered, I mean like the story isn't like centered on it, but it's not, the story doesn't center on it. It's not really from the point of view of characters or people who have been colonized. It's more from the descendants of the people who were the colonizers. But I still think it's a really interesting aspect of the book that it doesn't shy away from that. And it is very clearly anti-colonialism while still dealing with, okay, I'm anti-colonialism, but it happened already and I can't stop the past. So Yes, I really liked that conversation that the book is having with itself and with the readers. And like I said, this book series definitely influenced modern fantasy. Like you can tell it influenced modern fantasy. I think if you're a big fantasy fan, it's worth reading for that reason alone. It, you can, you can see the strings almost. Like what, what's that meme? I'll put a picture of it, but that's me. I'm like, oh, here's where it connects. Here's where it connects. So. I think it's worth it for that reason alone if you're a big fantasy reader. Before I say goodbye for today, I just wanted to talk about how I read these books. I actually listened to them on audiobook and read the physical copies. So about 70% of my reading actually came from the physical books, but because they were so long and because I wanted to actually, and because I wanted to actually finish them with like in a reasonable time, I would listen to the audiobooks to and from my way to work. Sometimes if I was like doing chores, that helped me in like some ways because I did kind of help me learn to pronounce character names and it gave me a really good sense of the voice of some of the characters.
but I also found myself almost disconnecting with the story more when I was reading or when I was like listening to it via audiobook. They are really well done. The narrator I will like put here because I don't have my phone on me so I can't double check. But he did a phenomenal job. He had really great distinct voices for every single character. He was, seriously the pronunciations of character and place names helped so much. I didn't even realize until I like started listening to audiobook just how hard some of them were to pronounce. Like Hernestir like is spelled with like a couple different Y's just like thrown in there. It's, it's great to actually know how to pronounce it and I that definitely enhanced my reading experience. But reading them on the like physical copy even when it's this giant like this chunky book like yeah like reading in bed was like this but it was still so much better to read it physically than it was to listen to audiobook at least for me it definitely did help me actually move forward with the story quicker though and to like actually I think I think if I had just read physical it would have taken me a lot longer to finish them and it probably would have left me with more days in between where I just didn't read any of the story having days like that I think would have made it easier for me to disconnect with it and forget details because there is so much going on so the audiobooks were a boon in that way as well. I asked I also buddy read this with a friend and a co-worker so I actually probably wouldn't have picked these books up if it wasn't for her. I've had the first book sitting on my bookshelf for a very long time and I think I picked it up even before uh, Witchwood Crown which is the start of the more recent trilogy. I think I picked them up right before that one came out and I was like yes I want to give this series a try and then just let it sit there for a very long time. But she recently read book one and she said it was really good and it's been a while since I've read like a big epic fantasy so I picked it up and I if you've watched my vlogs you know this but I could not stop reading them. I kept saying yeah I'm gonna have like a break between books but no I didn't and yes yeah, so I'm so glad that I was able to buddy read it with her. She was ahead of me for about half the read and then I got ahead of her about halfway through book two and she's about halfway through book three. She's almost done with it. And it's so fun to be able to talk to someone about them because it's not just like even theorizing but just to talk about the characters and the world and like moments and yeah it's been a while since I've buddy read anything like this. I don't think actually I've ever buddy read any like a whole series but this was great. It definitely enhanced the experience for me so yeah I just wanted to point that out as well. But thank you for coming to this review. Like I said, a non-spoiler one will be posted tomorrow about the same time. You can also definitely check out my reading vlogs. I will link them down below if you're curious, kind of like my thoughts as I was going. They're not super spoilery, so don't worry about spoilers in those. I'll definitely link them down below. But thank you for coming. Have a lovely rest of your day, and I will see you guys later. Bye!